Republic Day stands as a proud testament to the enduring legacy of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, honoring his monumental contributions to our nation. As we gather here to honor and delve into the rich legacy of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, let us begin by celebrating the spirit of our nation. I request everyone to kindly rise for the national anthem. जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे I now invite Dr. Deepak Kumar Srivastava, Dean, UG Studies and Director in Charge, School of Law and Governance to kindly deliver the welcome address. Good morning, one and all. The Constitution of India is a living document, living instrument with capabilities of enormous dynamism. It is a constitution made for a progressive society. Working on such a constitution depends upon the prevalent atmosphere and conditions. With these words, is spoken by our esteemed chief guest for today, Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra ji, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the auspicious occasion. It is a matter of great honor and pride for me to welcome you and express my gratitude for participating in the third B. R. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture organized by the Hidayatullah National University, Raipur. I would like to take this opportunity to express my profound appreciation for the chief guest of the ceremony, Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra ji, former Chief Justice of India and distinguished jurist professor of Hidayatullah National University, who has kindly consented to be the chief guest and to deliver the third Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture on the theme, actualization of Dr. Ambedkar's ideas, inclusiveness, equality, and affirmative rights. Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishaji, born on 3rd October 1953, he was enrolled as an advocate on 14th February 1977 and practiced in constitutional, civil, criminal, revenue, service, and self tax matters in the Urissa High Court and the Service Tribunal. Sir, was appointed as an additional judge of the Orissa High Court on 17 January 1996 and transferred to the Madhya Pradesh High Court on 3rd March 1997. He became permanent judge on 19 December 1997. Justice Mishra sir assumed charge of the Office of the Chief Justice of Patna High Court on 23rd December 2009. And charge of the Office of the Chief Justice of Delhi High Court on 24th May 2010. Sir was elevated as a Judge Supreme Court of India in 2011 and appointed as the Chief Justice of India on 28-8-2017. After an illustrious reason in the Indian Judiciary, Sir retired on October 2, 2018. Sir, we extend our hearty welcome to you at HNLU. We sell with joy and pride to have our mentor and guiding light 
Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Hidayatullah National Law University, our Vice Chancellor, who is an inspiring leader and a rare combination of vision, insight, intellect, and energy. We welcome you, sir, from our bottom of heart. We welcome Dr. Vipan Kumar, Registrar of Hidayatullah National University, who has been an administrative backbone of this institution since the day he assumed his office. We extend a joyous welcome to our deans, financial advisor, Sri Tarka Sri Nivas Raoji, and a staff member of this program. Your presence, motivation truly counts. We also welcome members of the press and other distinguished members of the legal fraternity. And last, but far from the least, me, my beloved student of Hidayatullah National Law University and students from ITM University and Rawatpura Sarkar University. We have, you have joined, who have joined to us, to, uh, joined us to hear to our esteemed dignitary. Once again, it is my honor and welcome you all to the vibrant and colorful campus of HNLU. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Thank you, sir. I now request Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, Honorable Vice Chancellor at HNLU, to deliver the opening remarks. Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra, former CJI of India, and also the distinguished Juris Professor of HNLU, Dr. Vipan Kumar, Registrar in Charge of HNLU, Dr. Deepak Srivastav, Dean Undergraduate Studies, other deans, colleagues, students from HNLU, and students from other institutions and other distinguished guests who have gathered here today. Let me start with a quote. However good a constitution may be, if those who are implementing it are not good, it will prove to be bad. However bad a constitution may be, if those implementing it are good, it will prove to be good. This is from Dr. Ambedkar, on whose name the memorial lecture is organized today. The realization of Dr. Ambedkar's dreams is a complex and ongoing process, and the assessment of their fulfillment depends upon various factors. Ambedkar, a key architect of Indian constitution, envisioned a society based on principles of social justice, equality, and the empowerment of the marginalized communities. While progress has been made in many areas, challenges and gaps persist. If I may highlight few according to me, what is the progress and what is the challenge? When it comes to social equality and caste discrimination, the progress is that several policy measures have been implemented to address caste-based discrimination, including affirmative action. There has been an increase in political representation of the marginalized communities. That is the progress. But there is a challenge. Caste discrimination still exists in various forms, affecting social interactions, education, and employment. Deep-rooted social prejudices and stereotypes continue to pose challenges to achieving true social equality. The next aspect today we need to touch upon is educational empowerment. The progress report reads that efforts have been made to increase access to education for marginalized communities through reservations and special schemes. Literacy rates among these communities have certainly improved. But on the challenge part, the educational disparities persist and quality education remains still a concern. Access to higher education and employment opportunities for the marginalized groups continues to be a yawning gap and a challenge. If I look at economic empowerment and poverty alleviation, the progress card reads various poverty alleviation programs and economic empowerment initiatives have been continuously launched. 
There has been economic progress in certain sections of the society, no doubt about that, but the challenges are that the disparities are also huge. Poverty still remains a challenge, especially in rural areas. Land reforms and equitable distribution of resources have been a limited success. If I look at the next part, political representation, there has been an increase in political representation of marginalized communities with reserved seats in legislative bodies. Several political leaders from these communities have played significant roles in our post-independence period. But the challenges, at times, it is referred, is it a tokenism? Is it a limited empowerment? And the need for broader political participation still persists. Effective representation at decision-making levels in very many institutions, there is definitely a deficit card. Look at dignity and human rights. The progress is legal frameworks and human rights protection have been established. Awareness about human rights has increased overall. But in challenge part, incidents of discrimination, violence, and human rights abuses continue to occur. Enforcement of human rights standards are uneven. Look at legal reforms and social justice, which all of us are directly involved. The Indian Constitution provides for a strong foundation of social justice and individual rights. Legal reforms, including recent judgments, does reflect efforts to address these issues. But the challenge part, implementation of this legal provision and ensuring justice for marginalized communities, again, is a challenge. Let me last come to the most neglected part, or which has been taken only in recent times, is women's rights, which Ambedkar has spoken a lot. So legal reforms have been enacted to protect women's rights, women's rights, and the judiciary has definitely played a stellar role in challenging discriminatory practices. But gender-based discrimination and violence persists. Achieving gender equality in various spheres remains an ongoing struggle for 50% of the population in the country which are women. While progress has been made in several areas, it is crucial to recognize achieving a comprehensive vision outlined by Dr. Ambedkar is a long-term and evolving process. This memorial lecture instituted at HNLU is an humble effort to disseminate, critique, and to cartograph the future path envisioned by the most incisive legal minds of our times. HNLU is thrilled and excited to have our distinguished jurist professor, Honorable Justice Deepak Mishraji, who served as a jurist for many decades, including donning the mantle of the Chief Justice of India between 2017 and 18. In his 13 months of heading the highest court of India, his judgments were high octane, reverberating even today. If just to highlight few about my speakers before I uh, leave the floor for him to, you know, interact with you. In May 2017, Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra presided over hearings petitioned by politi politicians, namely Rahul Gandhi, Arvind Kejriwal, and Subramaniam Swami. During these proceedings, he asserted that an individual's reputation should not be sacrificed at the altar of someone else's right to free speech. He speaks his mind and he set his tone on this, the thing between what you call as defamation as well as free speech. I quote him, the right to reputation is an integral part of Article 21 of the Constitution. It's a fundamental right of the individual. The bench upheld the 156-year-old defamation law, but in a very incisive and different way when he explained it. Coming to reforms, which the majority of the citizens are affected is that of police, where within 10 days of assuming the office, he issued a ruling aimed at enhancing the transparency and accountability of the police force. The Supreme Court directed all states to ensure first information reports are made available online within 24 hours of registration. This measure, according to the bench, would enable affected parties to seek redress in courts more effectively. So you can talk about his initiative in terms of a digital world connecting with the most vexatious area, what he call as police, FIR, and related issues. Then comes played a pivotal role in the landmark Supreme Court decision declaring 
section 377 of the Indian Penal Code as unconstitutional. Section 377 criminalized gay sex with a provision for imprisonment up to five years. Honorable CJI at the time emphasized this section violated the fundamental rights to choose a partner without fear and the basic right to championship. You look at it, this is, we are talking about almost nearing a decade and this has completely changed about anyone who had a different impression about how Indian judiciary and its interpretation moves compared to the rest of the world. Then comes again in the final week of his tenure, he declared section 497 of the IPC unconstitutional. This section defined adultery as a crime, specifying it as an offense committed by a man against a married man if he engaged on an adulterous relationship with the latest wife. The court struck down for violating again fundamental right of equality and he had his very incisive explanation why he took this decision and endorsed it. And also the bench upheld the constitutional validity of Aadhaar providing relief to the government. While the court ruled the Aadhaar could not be made mandatory for social welfare schemes availing rights, it does validate government's notification of linking it with PAN. So a very differential angle about privacy where he talks about individuals, you know, privacy rights, etc. Otherwise, vis-a-vis -vis what government can do with this identification. And most important, other two, three, couple of things which I will tell to finish is the Supreme Court, headed by him, declared the 1965 Kerala government rule barring women of menstruating age from entering the Sabarimala temple as unconstitutional. The ruling affirmed that women of all ages have the constitutional right to enter the temple, emphasizing that religion is a way of life with dignity equal for men and women. I do remember in another lecture where we invited him somewhere else, he wonderfully talked about constitutional morality and its clash with other age-old religious and other things and where does the balance lies and how one has to look was done. Then he also said, as I said, I think his love for technology is quite high. So I would say that he said that in a significant judgment, he said live streaming of Supreme Court proceedings. In his decision, the bench led by him stated that live streaming would bring transparency and accountability to the judicial process, reflecting a commitment to public interest. And finally, I think you know everybody rejoiced this during his tenure. The ninth judge bench of the Supreme Court declared the right of privacy as a fundamental right, further strengthening individual liberties. Sir, we are honored of your acceptance to be our distinguished Jewish professor and to be with us today to deliver this memorial lecture. We are confident and optimistic that this first visit of yours will be followed with many more visits to our campus to interact with our students and faculty and share your experiential thoughts and decisions when as a jurist what you are. Sir, we extend our hearty welcome to you today. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your insightful opening remarks, which has beautifully set the tone for today's enriching lecture. It is our distinct honor to invite Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra, former Chief Justice of India and distinguished jurist professor at HNLU, to deliver the third Dr. B. R. Ambedkar lecture, memorial lecture on actualization of Dr. Ambedkar's idea inclusiveness, equality, and affirmative actions. Honorable Sir, may I kindly request you to grace us with your lecture. <laughs> Professor, Dr. B.C. Vivekanandan, Vice Chancellor, HNLU, Dr. Deepak Srivastav, Dr. Bipin Kumar, members of the faculty, friends from the electronic and print media, 
my dear students ladies and gentlemen whatever has been told by mr sivastav and the vice chancellor i would request you to forget i assume you are here to listen to me with regard to ambedkar isn't it the eminent dr ambedkar prior to that i must tell you i am extremely delighted to be amongst you on this red letter day the republic day and i must unhesitatingly admit that it's really a great occasion to share the thoughts of dr ambedkar with young intellectuals i treat you as the jars of law because you are the student of a great university and guided a by a wise vice chancellor and a hard working faculty right all right dr ambedkar an eminent personality in the history of india believed with deepest faith and fought with active concern for social justice that put human dignity self respect and reclamation of human personality on the highest pedestal a thinker who believed in democratic philosophy that encapsulated the fundamental principles of liberty equality and fraternity he was very keen for a just society that would include the disadvantaged marginalized and underprivileged categories of the society i as a student of law and history consider that humanity has witnessed two illustrious and dedicated action oriented protagonists who had the about purpose to elevate the conditions of suffering class they are president Abraham Lincoln of United States of America and Dr B R Ambedkar the chief architect of our constitution i say without any fear of contradiction Dr Ambedkar shall always remain relevant for any society and can never and i mean never be dated time cannot erase him time cannot efface him time cannot destroy his thoughts that is dr ambedkar's way of thinking of social justice as well as democracy dr ambedkar as the chairman of the drafting committee of the constitution of india had effectively spearheaded social reformation in our great country as a norm builder he believed in the concept and actualization of social democracy throughout my speech i'll be emphasizing on social democracy without getting it divorced from political democracy and economic equality while speaking about social democracy ambedkar said i quote him 
political democracy cannot last unless there lies at the base of it social democracy. What does social democracy mean? It means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles of life. His ideas on inclusion and affirmation in the context of dealing with historical oppression faced by the marginalized sections of our society has immensely influenced the shaping of the constitution. His philosophy can be understood through his views on social, political, and economic equality, as well as his advocacy for affirmative action and the upliftment of oppressed groups. His idea of inclusion and affirmative action, I repeat, was aimed at annihilation of the age-old caste-based hierarchies, a kind of graded inequality, a creating a society that should embrace diversity and provide equal opportunities. And that is how we are here. I may state here that he conceived of a social equality as the real thrust, the real fulcrum of the progressive democracy. It is discernible from the following statement. He gave it on the 26th day, and I quote him. On the 26th day of January 1950, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we will have equality, and in social and economic life, we will have inequality. In politics, we'll be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value, unquote. That is what precisely your vice chancellor has been telling you that social equality, social justice as a normative equality concept has not yet been achieved, though we have achieved quite a lot. Ambedkar was convinced that the state has a crucial role to play in the annihilation of caste system. The state was advised to actively engage through legislation and policies to eliminate discrimination and provide equal opportunities for all citizens. Affirmative action was one such measure he advocated to address historical injuries and injustices. His aim was to promote the development of a more equal and inclusive society by law, as well as, I emphasize, change of collective mindset. He strongly believed that unless there is a transformation in social attitudes, social proclivities, and relationships, true democracy would remain a mirage. According to him, social inequality corrodes self-respect, inflicts ambition, affects the fighting spirit of the social victim. He proclaimed, discrimination is another menace that must be guarded against 
if that fundamental rights are to be real rights. If we want the fundamental rights in chapter 3 to be recognized, to be really realized, to be actualized, to be fortified, to be engrafted in the reality, then you have to really destroy, annihilate, annihilate discrimination in the truest sense of the term. That is what Dr. Ambedkar meant. He emphasized on the vital importance of political empowerment in the quest of a fair and inclusive society. His conception of reservation and affirmation action as a means of representation has significantly influenced the restructuring of India's political scene, aiming to guarantee that historically marginalized communities actively participate and influence the democratic process of the nation. He asserted that absence of reservations would lead to a systematic exclusion of marginalized and underprivileged communities from political involvement, and that is why you will find in the Constitution of India, Article 330 and 332. That was his endeavor to bring in. He faced lot of opposition if we go through the Constituent Assembly debates. But he succeeded. He succeeded because Ambedkar's mind is one of the greatest logical minds in history. And I'm not telling you without any proof. You just have a basis of the debates of the Constituent Assembly. He doesn't raise his voice. There is calmness in the words. When you read a speech, you can understand whether the man is angry, disturbed, or he's poised. He had a syllogistic pattern to convince people, and he did. Ambedkar considered economic empowerment as a fundamental prerequisite for achieving social justice. He argued that without addressing economic disparities through emancipation and empowerment of the marginalized communities would remain a distant image. For him, economic empowerment was not only a means of improving material conditions but also a pathway to dismantling the hierarchical structure perpetuated by the existing system. He argued that economic independence was crucial for breaking the cycle of poverty and exploitation faced by certain communities. He visualized access to land, access to education, and employment opportunity so that there can be progression in economics as far as the underprivileged is concerned and they get economically empowered. As our Shastras have said, unless a man has some artha, economics, powers, he can't really grow in life. When the stomach burns, he can't create. That's what great Kalidas said. In a different way, Ambedkar puts it in the context that you have to empower the society which is economically suffering. That is why he suggests there has to be cooperative societies, not to have cottage industry alone, but so that there can be a collective pool. They can have access to wealth, and they can also have the power of obtaining the prowess of money to invest. He also recommended that the society must shift, not completely, 
from the agrarian measure to the industrial measure so that they really become economically modern and that is how he can must for industrialization you see ambedkar was a man who thought of everything in a different way he thought of distribution of lands land reforms measures but he wanted to that state should do it and eventually as all of you know land reforms legislation came in various states and eventually they have been upheld by the constitutional courts affirmation as i understand from the perspective of dr ambedkar as a policy designed to address to remove systemic inequalities that has been reigning since centuries and that is why is put a new grammar of preferential treatment and that is why it holds significance he recognized the need for affirmative action to uplift the scheduled caste and other impecunious communities who have been subjected to discrimination exclusion and exploitation he advocated i quote the object of the fundamental rights is twofold first every citizen must be in a position to claim these rights secondly they must be binding on the authority on court if the all cannot enjoy the fundamental rights what's the purpose of having these fundamental rights and if they are not binding on the authorities there are letters on the paper sans any meaning sans any truth sans any possibility of realization ambedkar in the original constitution wanted to protect the scheduled caste scheduled tribe wanted to empower the women he always wanted desire from 1926 onwards that the women should be educated because without education or bereft of education they will re ever remain backward they can't com compete he always felt that the duty of the society to empower the women and that is why education was peremptory as far as dr ambedkar was concerned it would not be out of place to state here that the constitutional scheme and ethos commands social sensitivity one has to cultivate the said quality to have a seemly or pro appropriate constitutional vision of our compassionate constitutions without it the idea of inclusiveness would be an anathema i call the constitution of india as a compassionate constitution my young intellectuals please remember ambedkar was not only a sensitive person he was an extremely compassionate personality that is why you get a compassionate constitution the views of dr ambedkar on human rights and dignity are rooted in the belief that every individual possesses inherent dignity being a human i won't be wrong if i say ambedkar believed i am a human anything that relates to a human concerns me i care for their rights 
I care for their dignity. According to him, it's all written. I'm not inferring anything. According to him, in a democracy, an individual enjoys certain inalienable rights. That is what one sees in the fundamental rights, which cannot be affected by any kind of majoritarianism. In a democracy, the government is by the majority, but the individual rights stand absolutely sacrosanct and sanguine, and that cannot be dented by any kind of majoritarian social philosophy or social guidance. That's what exact case said, and he meant it. Human rights, which is the thrust of Ambedkarian thought, is to accept the intrinsic worth of any person, the significance of equality and non-discrimination in upholding human dignity was highlighted by him. And accordingly, he worked towards establishing a legal framework that explicitly prohibited discrimination on the basis of caste, creed, gender, or religion. His vision was to ensure that every citizen enjoyed equal protection under the law, cultivating a society where dignity is universally respected. He carried on his crusade against the practice of untouchability, as he considered to be a gross right which ushered in perceptible inequality. The efforts culminated Article 17 in the Constitution of India, which abolishes untouchability and makes it a punishable offense. And I must say, it has been a part of the Constitution so that the statutory laws can be made by the Parliament and the state legislatures. You are all young. Do you respect each other? I assume so, that you must be respecting each other. Ambedkar used to say, inclusion or inclusive society rests on the foundation of fraternity. He sensitized the society in a different way. He sensitively realized the inseparable nexus between the idea of fraternity, inclusiveness, and democracy. In that context, he articulated, and I quote, there should be varied and free points of contact with other modes of association. In other words, there should be social endosmosis. This is fraternity, which is only another name for democracy. Democracy is not merely a form of government. It's primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. It is essentially an attitude of respect and reverence towards fellow men, unquote. The purpose of sharing this thought of Dr. Ambedkar with you. All of us claim, I live in a great democracy. I live in a large democracy. I live in the largest democracy. Fine. But do you respect your fellow men? Do you respect your colleagues? Do you respect your classmates? I mean, these are the questions to be put and understood. Needless to state, Dr. Ambedkar was deeply inspired by the idea of fraternity in social, religious, civic, and economic matters. And according to him, when it is achieved, then inclusiveness becomes a norm 
and a way of life and the conflict between competing individual interest really grow with liberty, equality, and the problem gets resolved. Ambedkar again spoke on fraternity. Why I am emphasizing on fraternity? That's a part, an inseparable part of social democracy, social justice, and it's a part of our preamble. Do never forget the preamble of the Constitution. Now let's see what Dr. Ambedkar says. Fraternity means a sense of common brotherhood of all Indians. It is the principle which gives unity and solidarity to social life. It's a difficult thing to achieve. But we must overcome all these difficulties if we wish to become a nation in reality. For fraternity can be a fact only when there is a nation. Without fraternity, Equality and liberty will be no deeper than a coal of pain, a coat of pain, nothing else. They lose their meaning. It's just a coat of paint. It has no sense. Look at the emphasis the gentleman had given during his time on social justice and fraternity. And do you think they're relevant? Irrelevant today? They're not relevant? They're still relevant. That is why I will say something later on, subject to discussion. To usher in inclusiveness and fraternity in the Indian society has been a challenging task. As recognized by Dr. Ambedkar and by all of us in present time, undoubtedly affirmative action by the body polity goes a long way in actualizing the solemn idea of inclusiveness. But for inclusiveness to become truly ingrained in the Indian society, our populace must also make endeavor. Believing in true intent can always bring the desired result. Unless we have the intention, we cannot achieve any result. That is what Ambedkar said. And today, when I'm giving the third Ambedkar lecture, it's my duty to ingrain in your mind, heart, soul, that please realize this philosophy. You see, this inclusiveness, fraternity, as I told you once, Ambedkar said, it's at the root of democracy. Slightly surprising, my look that democracy is a government by, all, by the people, for the people, all the people we have told, we have read. And why this man is putting fraternity is the root of democracy. He is speaking in the Indian context. My friends, please try to understand that. You see, in Subramanyam Swami case, a two judge been said on fraternity. I quote, Fraternity under the Constitution expects every citizen to respect the dignity of the other. Mutual respect is the fulcrum of fraternity that assures dignity. I think uh, Mr. Sivasta talked about, and Ms. the Vice Chancellor also talked about it, the defamation case. The reputation versus the free speech. The court said, free speech is there. You have a right to dissent. You have a right to disagree. You have a right to criticize. But you don't have a right to create a dent in the other person's reputation. Because that's an inseparable part of a right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution. The same philosophy has been recently, 2023, so I call it recently, a Constitution bench retreats. And I quote, democracy 
being one of the basic features of our constitution. It is implicit that in a rule by majority, there would be a sense of security and inclusiveness. Further, the preamble of the constitution, which envisages into earlier fraternity, assures that the dignity of the individuals cannot be dented by means of unwarranted speech being made by the fellow citizens, including public functionaries. Ambedkar had said, go back to Dr. Ambedkar, please, I quote, self-respect is the most vital factor in life. Without this, man is a mere cipher. That's the exactly the Supreme Court has said, a constitution bench. It matters to the person concerned. Dr. Ambedkar's legal endeavors to constitute the bedrock of constitutional commitment as the thrust of inclusiveness and equality are extremely significant. His manner of logical persuasion and active participation as is seen from the Constituent Assembly debates, will remain an enduring legacy. As India continues to navigate the complexities of social justice, Ambedkar's Legal Contributions Act as a laser beam, guiding the nation towards a more inclusive and egalitarian future, an egalitarian society, where Individual is respected, words are molded for modern interpretation without creating any dent in the original thought and purpose. That is why initially I have said Dr. Ambedkar can never be dated. He is not a man of history, he is a man in present. That's the greatness in him. And why I am here? I am only here to make you aware of the thoughts of Dr. Ambedkar from a different kind of social perspective. We want our younger generation to become ideal citizens. And I am feeling extremely proud that I have the privilege to deliver this lecture and extremely proud to talk to people. It's extremely pleasure for someone when he's able to talk to young minds. You know why? Young minds possess certain ingredients in their mind which can invent things, which can create different kind of philosophies and great thinkers have said never, never neglect the intellect of the young and you are very courteous people, pleasant people and I am obliged to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for an insightful session and for illuminating the topic. Or Hamare Purhue Abi Batniki Kirpakare. जब वो पैदल चलकर आएंगे तो आपको लग जाएगा वो पैदल आने के लिए उन्होंने सूचना दी है वो पैदल आएंगे अभी बैठ जाइए मैं उत्तरी भाग के संतों से निवेदन करता हूं बैठ जाइए बैठ जाइए
माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी पूर्वी द्वार से पैदल भगवान का एक छत्र लेकर ऊपर चढ़ रहे हैं वो सीधे गर्भगृह में प्रवेश करेंगे द्वार से प्रवेश हो गया नृत्य मंडप में प्रवेश कर गए रंग मंडप में प्रवेश हो गया वो पूर्ण मंडप में प्रवेश करने वाले हैं वहीं पर सब सप्तगढ़ राष्ट्रीय स्वयंसेवक संघ के सरसंघचालक डॉक्टर मोहन राव भागवत उत्तर प्रदेश के माननीय मुख्यमंत्री योगी आदित्यनाथ जी उत्तर प्रदेश की राज्यपाल महोदया आनंदी बेन पटेल राम जन्मभूमि तीर्थ क्षेत्र के अध्यक्ष नृत्य गोपाल दास जी महाराज उपस्थित हैं केशव पाराशरण जी वासुदेवानंद सरस्वती जी महाराज युग पुरुष परमानंद जी महाराज अन्य सभी ट्रस्टीगण वहीं पर उपस्थित हैं बारह बजकर सात मिनट हो गया है गर्भगृह में प्रवेश हो चुका है चांदी के छत्र गर्भगृह में गोविंद देव जी श्री राम के विश्व गर्भगृह की ओर पढ़ाते हुए एक एक कदम बढ़ाते हुए अनेक मंडपों को पार करते हुए पांच मंडपों को पार करते हुए उस अद्भुत क्षण के साक्षी होने जा रहे हैं जो विश्व में एक इतिहास रचेगा श्री अयोध्या धाम जो कि वैकुंठ का हृदय कहा जाता है आज अत्यंत प्रफुल्लित है आज उल्लास चारों ओर आज आनंद चारों ओर क्यों न हो भगवान श्री राम पधारे हैं भगवान श्री राम प्राण प्रतिष्ठित होने जा रहे हैं चेतना का संचार होने जा रहा है भगवान श्री राम की उस मूर्ति में जो इस वक्त थोड़ी ही देर बाद आप देखेंगे की कमल पत्र पर वो विराजमान खड़े भक्तों को दर्शन देंगे नव्य और भव्य रूप में साथ ही साथ पुराने रामलला विराजमान भी अपने स्वरूप में स्वर्ण सिंहासन पर भक्तों को दर्शन देंगे वो दिव्य दर्शन जिसके लिए सभी की आंखें तरस रही थी दिव्य क्षण युगांतकारी क्षण प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी पहुंच चुके हैं गर्भगृह में प्राण प्रतिष्ठा होनी है भगवान श्री राम के बाल मूर्ति के बाल विग्रह की इन क्षणों को अगर देखें तो प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी समूची सनातन संस्कृति के बिंब के रूप में कर्तव्य परायण स्वरूप में धर्म परायण स्वरूप में 140 करोड़ देशवासियों के प्रतिनिधि के रूप में तेज तप और तपश्चर्या के पर्याय के रूप में भारत भारतीयता के अग्रदूप के रूप में और साथ ही साथ सनातन संस्कृति के ध्वजवाहक के रूप में प्रस्तुत हैं गर्भगृह में सनातन संस्कृति के संवाहक के रूप में भारत की एकात्मता के भारत के वैभव के इस अटूट प्रदर्शन के आज दिन को पूरी दुनिया साक्षी हो रही है और अगर देखें तो निश्चित तौर से जिस तरीके से प्रधानमंत्री जी पहुंचे हैं कहा जा सकता